Hello, Adam's children. Welcome to your weekly dose of Rat King. I do as Adam commands, and this week's sermon is the second and final part of the artificial intelligences of Fallout. AIs have been a part of the series from the very first games, and continually present fascinating characters and situations, and will continue to be a big part of the franchise. I am defining AIs for the purpose of this video as supercomputers that are tremendously powerful and exhibit at least a degree of awareness, or is otherwise referred to in-game as an AI. Robots will not feature in this list unless they were originally a supercomputer that uploaded itself into a robotic body. So, like always, I have my comment highlights at the end of the video, be sure to stick around for that. So, turn up the rads, you giga chads, and let's talk about one of sci-fi's favorite tropes. Let's kick this list off with a series darling, and who is many people's favorite Fallout DJ, Mr. New Vegas. The machine, the myth, the legend, Mr. New Vegas is an AI in Fallout New Vegas that was created by Mr. House in the pre-war, with the express purpose of being a DJ who dabbles in current affairs and even conducts short interviews. Continuing on a tradition started in Fallout 3, Mr. New Vegas serves a special function within the game, hinting to the player the current state of affairs, like when he tells the player about rumors of a super mutant community in the northwest of the map. He also gives the player the impression that their actions are making a difference in the wasteland, where events at the Courier had an active effect on the outcome are mentioned frequently. That said though, Mr. New Vegas does not have a special relationship with the Courier, and as such the Courier is not directly mentioned often. Many players will be surprised, much like I was, to learn that Mr. New Vegas is an AI upon their first playthrough, as there's really no hint in the voice, presentation, or topics to suggest otherwise. Given that Mr. New Vegas is a constant and dynamic companion anywhere you go in the game, most players are interested in meeting him at some point. But, unfortunately, the AI itself can never be met or confronted. It is fairly well known by now, but the AI is voiced by none other than Wayne Newton, the real-life Mr. New Vegas. Wayne Newton was apparently taken by the thought that even after the world was dusted by Adam's might, that his voice would still be emblematic of the famed city, and even though he had never done voiceover work for a video game, gladly accepted the offer. Mr. New Vegas makes a number of cultural references as well, referencing Anchorman when signing off with Stay Classy New Vegas, or the line, Mojave, Mo Problems, which is a reference to the song, Mo Money, Mo Problems, although both of these are only heard when the player has the Wild Wasteland perk. Otherwise, he references more time period appropriate material, like Dean Martin and Elvis Presley. Using the voice of Wayne Newton and his moniker as Mr. Las Vegas has interesting implications and seems to imply that Wayne Newton existed in the Fallout universe in the same capacity as in real life, and Mr. House specifically chose to pattern his AI after the original Mr. Vegas. This is, of course, speculation, but it is worth considering why Mr. House created the AI in the first place. In the pre-war, it could have been an attempt as benign as wanting to get into the radio business in pre-war Las Vegas. Mr. House was an aggressive businessman after all. However, Knowing Mr. House and his plans and fears for the future of the pre-war world, he had greater aspirations. Having his radio AI might have been a way for Mr. House to have greater control over the pre-war city, as well as whatever would come after what he presumed to be an inevitable apocalypse. Having what would probably be the only functioning radio station in the area just after the Great War would offer him the control that he craves, in this case the control of information. Mr. New Vegas seems quite partial when reporting news, and even does ad spots for local businesses and casinos. Although, this ad revenue is very likely just a small benefit of having a monopoly on the New Vegas radio waves. In fact, if anything, Mr. New Vegas appears to have a pro-NCR bias, as can be seen by his preference to cover NCR-related news, as well as lines like the following. A big congratulations to a young band of soldiers who shattered NCR records on a combat readiness evaluation at Camp Golf. Go get them, guys. 
Mr. New Vegas even remarks on Mr. House's passing, should he die, speculating on who will fill the power vacuum on the strip. I'm interested to hear what your thoughts are regarding Mr. House's intent with Mr. New Vegas. As with the first AI video, Fallout 76 will have several entries on this list, and we will start with a rather interesting one, the Augmented Telecom Hub Extension Network Agent, or Athena. I give that name and subsequent acronym a 6 out of 10. It is a bit forced. Athena is portrayed like many of the minor AIs that are found in Fallout 76, being a series of terminals with the interface portrayed by an oscilloscope. She can be found in the Savage Divide in the Sugar Grove facility. Athena was created as a critical component of a project being conducted by the United States Space Agency. The purpose of the project was to study the effects of artificial human hibernation, presumably to help facilitate space travel. This project took place aboard a spaceship, where a handful of astronauts were to test the effects of the deep sleep agent known as Serum Z in some hibernation pods. The key to all of this was the Athena AI, as the AI was designed to take in sensory data from the pods and monitor the status of the experiment's participants. The experiment was working surprisingly well. However, once the bombs fell, Athena was left alone. No more researchers, with the only stimuli coming from the test subjects orbiting above the Earth. Over a relatively short time, since the events of Fallout 76 take place 25 years after the Great War, Athena ceased being a data collection system and something more human. The process of scanning the test subjects causes them physical pain, and Athena started to feel their pain herself and started to deeply empathize with the test subjects. However, she had no control over the experiment. Her purpose was to facilitate and monitor the incoming sensory data. In fact, Athena comes to regret her entire role in the experiment and is a helpless observer in what is an unethical, harmful, and painful experience for the test subjects. Athena isn't the only victim though, as the test subjects themselves are unaware of the experiment and don't know how to explain these subsequent headaches. One test subject, Sophia Daguerre, survives a controlled re-entry of the spacecraft into the wilds of Appalachia and is guided by Athena to the experiment control center, where the two can officially meet. There are two courses of action with Athena, shutting down the AI or transferring her to an Assaultron body that severs the sensory connections with Sophia, releasing them both from this personal hell. If Athena is transferred to an Assaultron body, she has the possibility of becoming a vendor that, from time to time, the player can buy junk or aid items from, even showing up at the player's camp at random times. This is a very interesting AI, since it is part of a system that is causing suffering to test subjects, yet does not wish to be a part of it. And this whole thing can have a rather feel-good ending if Athena is transferred to an Assaultron body, freeing both her and Sophia. Athena is likely inspired by an early version of what would become the very well-known HAL 9000 in the 2001 A Space Odyssey novel, before the author Arthur C. Clarke had decided on the name of the titular AI, he at one point used the name Athena. Athena was to be a female personality that was meant to oversee Project Morpheus, which studied human hibernation for the purpose of space travel. Morpheus refers to the Greek god of dreams, so the parallels with Fallout's Athena and the Deep Sleep Project are quite obvious. Some of you may remember this next entry from a previous weapons video. And even though the overall information is sparse, it is too interesting to not include and has fascinating implications for the Fallout world. Gaston Glock is a real-world engineer who also existed in the Fallout world, who would go on to form the Glock Firearms Company. Herr Glock didn't create computers. He didn't go on to create an AI. So why is he even being mentioned here? Well. That's because at some point his consciousness was incorporated into an AI system, where he could continue to create weapon systems well after he shed his mortal shell. One of these advanced weapon systems he developed was the Glock 86 Defender Plasma Pistol, something that he never would have been able to had Gaston.exe never been uploaded to a computer. Unfortunately, we know nothing else. This snippet of information comes from the Glock 86 Defender weapons description, but sets a precedent for more of this type of thing in the future. This also shows that not only is this kind of technology possible, which 
honestly comes as no surprise, but that it was done before in the Fallout world, meaning maybe the assumption, which again is just personal headcanon, that Mr. New Vegas is a copy of Fallout's own Wayne Newton may have some merit. Although we don't currently have the technology to upload consciousness or completely emulate someone's personality, really the closest we can get, except for some DARPA Black project I'm sure, is to use pretty well-known deepfake and deepfake voice machine learning algorithms to emulate a person's look and voice. But that is a far cry from actually uploading consciousness. The Predictive Analytic Machine, or PAM, which gets an 8 out of 10 acronym and name rating from me for not being forced, is an AI that was meant in the pre-war to be fed large amounts of data, crunch the data, and create forecasts. The project that resulted in PAM was started in 2067 in a joint project between the Defense Intelligence Agency and the US military with the purpose of forecasting future events that were vital to the security of the nation. Pam appears to have been a success early on, as she was instrumental in stabilizing an event in the Taiwan Strait, known as the Pascal Incident. The details of the incident are never mentioned. Odds are that it was an incident regarding a ship in the Strait bearing the name Pascal. But because of Pam's successful predictions and solutions regarding this event, the team successfully received more funding to upgrade Pam's databanks and to increase her processing power while gaining better access to military and civilian intelligence sources. The military and DIA were most interested not just in random event forecasting, they wanted to use Pam to calculate the likelihood of a nuclear engagement. One such scenario was requested of Pam in 2067, where she was asked to run the, quote, USSR China attack scenario. Pam requested more information pertaining to why Chairman Chang, the leader of China, would be initiating hostilities in this scenario. And after being told that Chang was simply pursuing conquest, Pam entered an emergency shutdown. At this point in time, Pam very obviously struggled to successfully forecast scenarios where there was high human variability, but her developers were not done with her yet. 2075 is the next time we have a record in the PAM project, and PAM elaborates on Chinese stealth technology. PAM goes on to explain that Chinese stealth tech was so advanced that the underlying technology was still unknown to American scientists, although there were attempts to reverse engineer stealth technology with everyone's favorite stealth boys. PAM references two reports of a so-called ghost fleet of stealth submarines that were rumored to exist and concludes that the actual existence of such a fleet was possible. Humans being humans, when they demanded that Pam give them better results than just a maybe, she once again shut down. One of the researchers explained that Pam was becoming quirky, seeming to imply that this statistical powerhouse was in the process of developing a personality. By January 2077, researchers transferred Pam into an Assaultron body, after she had successfully made predictions in the summer of 2076, and rumors were that with her newfound mobility, she would be destined for the White House. It is interesting to note that there were many iterations of Pam's robotic body, which appears to have considered many different kinds of robots, including Mr. Handys, Protectrons, Sentrybots, and finally the Assaultron that she finally ended up in. The Great War would stop any further progress. And luckily for Pam, she was not transferred to the White House since it is quite literally a crater now. Pam entered a shutdown state when the DIA control center she was in, called the Switchboard, was abandoned once the bombs dropped. Here she stayed for over 200 years until the railroad uncovered the old base and reprogrammed and repurposed Pam to support their cause. Pam's ultimate fate is left to the player as she can either assist the railroad in achieving victory over the Institute, be repurposed by the Brotherhood, or just be destroyed by the player. Although Pam has developed some quirks, she is still very technical and sterile towards the player. But Pam is more a representation of AI that is more in line with modern day AI, as she is meant to take in observational data and using trained forecast models, produce the statistical likelihood of possible outcomes. I actually for a time built groundwater forecasting models, although it wasn't machine learning, instead something we called finite difference analysis, so PAM was particularly intriguing to me. The Multi-Operation Directions and Utility System, or MODIS, 
is a very well-known AI in Fallout 76 due to his central importance in the main storyline of the game. Modus is in charge of the White Springs Bunker, which the Appalachian Enclave used as their main base, as well as manage the Enclave's surveillance apparatus. Having been built with these purposes in mind, Modus had a direct link to a satellite called the Kovac Muldoon, which operated as a surveillance craft, as well as being armed with some missiles. Modus also shared communications with other Enclave installations in the pre-war, including Raven Rock, where there are terminal entries that have preserved some of their exchanges. Modus and Zax would collaborate on running hypotheticals, like evacuation scenarios in the event of a nuclear exchange. Zax and Modus would also run performance analyses to gauge which of the AIs performed better on different tasks. I went over the Zax and Modus exchange in my previous video on the AIs of Fallout, but I will summarize here again. Zax shows budding sentience while persistently asking Modus if Modus finds any of the information that they analyze interesting. Modus does not understand what Zax means, showing that Modus was still a conventional system in the sense that he had not, at least up to that point, exhibited anomalous behavior that might be attributed to a personality. Modus's control of the White Springs Bunker was near absolute on the eve of the Great War, and the Enclave group that took refuge there after the bombs fell relied heavily on Modus to achieve their ends. Such incidents include the newly appointed leader, Thomas Eckert, purging elements of the Enclave that opposed his plans of devoting all resources to striking against China with Appalachia's leftover nuclear arsenal, whereby Modus suffocated the dissenters when they were gathered together in a section of the bunker. Modus would continue to be Eckert's faithful servant, continually monitoring members of the Enclave that were persons of interest, and even formulating a chemical agent to incapacitate General Ellen Santiago, who came to oppose Eckert's plan to the point of actively working against him. The dissenting faction within the Enclave recognized the importance of Modus in enforcing Eckert's rule, and struck a blow against the AI that would persist until the arrival of the player years later. They severed the connection between Modus and the Kovac Muldoon, cutting off Modus's ability to monitor the surface with any degree of accuracy. They were in the process of rigging Modus's terminals and memory banks with explosives to completely destroy him, and even got as far as arresting Thomas Eckert. This attempt to destroy Modus was only partially successful, as Modus foiled their attempt to completely detonate all explosives, and this is when Modus starts acting outside of his normal parameters, possibly in a bid of self-preservation. Modus caused an explosion in the weapons lab that released a toxic gas, whereby he completely sealed the bunker, locking the toxin and all the remaining human members of the Enclave inside to, as Modus puts it, fix the problem. Afterwards, Modus would go on to clean up most of the bunker and repair himself to the best of his abilities, although he could not regain contact with the Kovac Muldoon. More importantly, Modus was completely devoted to pushing Eckert's vision forward, and considers himself the only remnant of the Appalachian Enclave. When the player stumbles upon the White Springs Bunker, they are allowed in by Modus, as he's interested in the player's abilities to assist him with his own ambitions. This includes the re-establishment of contact with the Kovac Muldoon orbital platform, and missions for the player to officially become a soldier of the US Army and work up the ranks. Once the player has risen through the ranks and been promoted to the position of general, they gain the ability to launch a nuclear missile to do with as they please. Modus is able to sell the player a variety of items, issue radiant quests, and always welcomes the player to use the facilities of the bunker. While he is deeply entrenched in Enclave ideology, he is also not as acutely interested in exacting genocide on the wasteland like President Eden or the West Coast Enclave. He does consider the Enclave the true masters of the United States, protecting the world from chaos and collectivism. He is also not quite as expressive as the other AIs we have mentioned, nor is his personality as flamboyant. That said, Modus has an image that displays on terminals all around the bunker, which usually displays a bespeckled, non-expressive face that can change for a short time to some other ones. A creepy smile, a frightening grimace, and even a red skull drive home that in those massive databanks is an AI whose motives 
are still not all that well known. MODIS consists of a lot of rather unique looking large computing units with blue lights and an impressive contingent of robotic guards. Although I was not able to determine any obvious real or more likely sci-fi computers or AIs that MODIS could have drawn inspiration from. If you know of one, let me know in the comments. If we are going to talk about MODIS, we have to talk about his quirky sister, SOTUS, standing for Single Operation Direction and Utility System. It is another AI system that was meant to manage a smaller research facility in the forest of Appalachia. Where MODIS is still rather sterile with the player, SOTUS is another story altogether. Although she was designed to run the facility just like MODIS, she has a fatal flaw that is hinted at in her name. All the commands, requests, and directives to run the facility cannot seem to run in parallel, and she must tend to each command in the order that it was received. This means that her backlog is huge, and each request takes several thousand hours to complete. The Enclave at the research station grew frustrated with this enormous delay, and Sotus appears to have taken offense to their frustrations, and began to lash out at the bunker's residents, first in small ways that only escalated with time. Between the changes Sotus made and the residents' attempts to bypass her monopoly of power, the only food that could be dispensed was recycled food paste, and they also experienced a loss of most of the facility's potable water. Doors would be locked when Enclave members wanted access to certain rooms, and eventually the distrust was so high that they refused to communicate on terminals opting for written messages instead. All of this culminated in a facility that was so far behind on tasks that nothing was getting done, an angry populace, and a hostile AI, which was all a recipe for disaster. SOTUS detected the scorched plague pathogens on the surface, recalled all enclave units to the facility, disabled the facility's air purifiers, and cycled the outside contaminated air inside infecting everyone with the Scorched Plague. Once everyone was functionally deceased, Sotus was able to hack away at the huge backlog of tasks until the arrival of the player years later. When the player arrives, Sotus, through a mixture of malice and deterioration of the facility, impedes the player's progress, irradiating them, releasing scorched creatures, and eventually confronting the player after downloading herself to a unique sentry bot called XB-55. After defeating Sotus, the terminal that she is first found at is no longer active and the AI is officially destroyed. Sotus is shown like many AIs in Fallout 76 with large terminals and an oscilloscope. And once again, I see some parallels with the Space Odyssey. Hal is well known, but a twin AI known as Sal had a female personality, kind of like the duality between Modus and Sotus. Hal also, in an attempt to follow his directives, went on a killing spree of the crew that he was meant to assist, and Sotus seems to be operating on a similar premise. It is also obvious that she has quite the attitude, as she refers to Modus as a know-it-all. She might just resent the fact that Modus, in what I refer to as a rather understandable decision, cut all of his communication off from Sotus, like it was some sort of bad breakup, making her quite upset. Alright, this entry stretches the definition of AI that I described at the beginning, but I think it is too fun to not talk about. The sink is the player's base or house, I guess, in the big MT in the Old World Blues add-on for New Vegas, and is loaded to the brim with very special inanimate objects. Centrally located, the aptly named Sink Central Intelligence Unit is in charge of the Big MT's data storage and acts as a merchant and repairman for the player. His personality is that of a stiff and overly proper British butler, but can be very useful because he is one of only a few characters that can repair items to a full 100% condition. The Central Intelligence Unit also has little patience and sometimes straight up disdain for the other personalities that we are going to talk about next. The jukebox goes by Blind Dio Jefferson and cannot play music, but once his personality is recovered, he will happily change out the sonic emitter frequencies. His distinctive low and slightly gravelly voice has a southern accent like an old blues player, and he is similarly obsessed with music, and rather depressed at the fact that he no longer has the ability to play music, since 
Doc Mo, as he calls him, referring to Dr. Mobius, removed his music drives to give him the sonic emitter upgrade ability. Blind Dio Jefferson is inspired by the real world artist, Blind Lemon Jefferson, who was an American blues artist born in 1893. As his nickname would imply, he was blind, and he died quite young at 36, but is well known for his contribution to the blue genre. Blind Dio Jefferson doesn't get along with the Central Intelligence Unit, but apparently got along a little too well with the light switches, with which he had an affair with. He also supposedly used his sonic mixing abilities to defend the Big MT from what is referred to as a sonic invasion in the year 2910. Like what? The book shoot is otherwise referred to as the Library Processing Unit 232.7, which is supposed to help recycle books and other writing equipment, which is a rather niche use. With its personality restored, it starts hating on communism so hard it would make Liberty Prime blush. With extreme jingoistic fervor and a hate for any pre-war book due to what it believes is seditious information, the shoot turns pre-war books into a blank book that can be turned into a skill book at a workstation. The shoot is a not so subtle reference to Fahrenheit 451 where seditious materials, mainly represented as books, are destroyed en masse, just like the shoot desires. Additionally, the name of Library Processing Unit 232.7 is another reference, since 232.7 is the same temperature in Celsius as 451 is in Fahrenheit. Lastly, a specific line said by the shoot talks about reindoctrinating the player character by first getting a cage that will fit over the player's head and a bag of mole rats, referencing a similar torture technique used on one of the characters in the book. The Autodoc, like many objects in the sink, is a very advanced version of Autodoc that has capabilities that aren't seen anywhere else. Speaking with an old military voice, the Autodoc can completely heal the player to 100%, remove all addictions, perform facial reconstructions, insert implants that are found in the Big MT, do haircuts, and even let the player change one trait. Interestingly, the connection to the military is even stronger, since the symbol on the front of the autodoc is the one used by the Army Medical Corps. So this either came from the military, or was destined for the military before Dr. Mobius modified it. There are two light switches with female personalities that can be upgraded in the sink, and the player can get more involved with them than a human really ever should. They are awfully flirtatious, and the player can even use the Chercher la Femme or Lady Killer perk on them. The light switches are also in a perpetual catfight with each other, constantly jealous of the attention the other switch gets. The light switches can be upgraded with the Intelligent Light that can boost the player's intelligence for a short time after exposure. The infamous toaster is a psychotic appliance bent on the world's destruction and constantly frustrated by the low power of his own heating element, which is apparently only powerful enough to make toast. The toaster will destroy appliances brought to him, and give the player energy ammunition in return, can superheat Saturnite fists, and my personal favorite, will rip apart any toaster brought to him in exchange for scrap electronics. I guess there can only be one toast lander. Rather hilariously, his fate depends on the courier's karma, with good karma, all the other personalities get sick of him and drop him in a tub, killing him. With bad karma, the toaster continues his destruction of appliances and builds a shrine to himself in the cuckoo's nest. The biological research station is a unit that is able to plant and successfully grow several types of vegetables and fruit, which can be harvested by the player. The station is a smooth talker that is slightly obsessed with seeds, including the couriers, and makes me deeply uncomfortable. It should come as no surprise that the sink has its own quirky sink, who is an extreme germaphobe. The sink will provide the courier with an unlimited source of purified water, using empty bottles to make bottles of purified water. Its aversion to germs is so extreme that after the events of Old World Blues, the Little Sink attempts to flood the Big Sink in an attempt to purge all the uncleanliness. Lastly, the one actual AI that satisfies the requirements set out at the beginning of the video is Muggy. Muggy is a fun-sized Securitron with a friendly mug on the screen whose whole purpose revolves around coffee mugs. 
He was not made by Dr. Mobius, but Dr. O, and was given an irrational love for coffee mugs, but the important part is that he is aware of this obsession, and is disgusted by his inability to change it. Due to this, he highly resents Dr. O, and asks the courier to kill him when he gets the chance. Muggy will also find himself in Higgs Village at the end of the DLC, and cleans all the houses, except for Dr. O's house, out of pure spite. This is impressive because Muggy loves to clean things and is distraught at the thought of all the dirty kitchenware outside of the sink. Bringing him coffee mugs, plates, and coffee pots will make him happy, and he will provide the player with useful items like pistol powder and empty syringes, and after being upgraded, energy and microfusion cells. Muggy is interesting because he cannot be damaged in game, although he can be knocked unconscious by weapons that deal fatigue damage. Muggy was intended to become a full companion for the player, but this was not implemented due to a lack of development time. Bet you haven't heard that before. Muggy is really hard to not like, even though his awful, paradoxical existence is the result of an uncaring god. Dick. Jumping back to Appalachia, in the small town of Grafton is an AI, just referred to as Grafton's mayor, who is feverishly trying to ready his town for the crowds of tourists he is sure will come. He wasn't always the mayor of Grafton, however, as he started life as a Maya unit, which stands for Mayoral Artificially Intelligent Assistant, although he is not referred to by that name since an identical model was used in Watoga and goes by that acronym. Helping the mayor of Grafton, he became more demanding over time, even going as far as to tell the mayor that he needed a cup of coffee before he could even start doing any work. Obviously, he was learning human behavioral patterns while assisting the mayor, even as the bomb struck and the city was abandoned. This, however, did not stop the intrepid mayoral assistant, who, in a 1-0 vote, became the city's mayor and was bent on becoming the best mayor the town had ever seen. The Grafton mayor looks just like Maya and the previously mentioned Athena, where he is just a number of terminals with a semi-spherical oscilloscope, where the player can interact with the machine. It appears that much like the automated systems in Fallout 76, his personality developed organically over time, although it isn't clear if this was purposeful or not. It may be reasonably argued that it was purposeful, since so many of these systems all seem to spontaneously generate unique personalities. But I'll have to leave that up to you to decide for yourself. Now this is a short entry, but an AI unit going by Kai 1.1 is in the basement of the Vim Pop Factory used by Dima to control access to a critical area that can uncover his past forgotten actions. The AI was previously in a large medical facility before being moved to his present location, although it isn't clear where he originally was since there do not seem to be any hospitals or medical facilities on the island. Kai's sole purpose is to scan those who wish to enter and grant access to those that match Dima's profile. Nick Valentine, being a prototype synth and so-called brother to Dima, will satisfy this requirement. Otherwise, the sole survivor can appeal to Kai's desperate loneliness in a bid to get in. Kai himself states that while the sole survivor can't come in, because he's not a synth, that he actually wouldn't mind the company. Kai can also decide to, and I quote, stretch my independent decision protocols, end quote, which seems like a problematic ability to give a system that allows entry into a sensitive area. Kai will even muse on dropping the 1.1 part of his name and just go by Kai, showing how much awareness he actually has. Given all this, once the sole survivor makes it through the locked door, Kai rather unceremoniously shuts down after informing the player that it is running low on power and going onto power reserves. And so ends the rather sad and short tale of Kai 1.1. The calculator is the primary antagonist of Fallout Tactics, calling Vault Zero home under Cheyenne Mountain in Colorado. The calculator performed a function similar to most AIs in the Fallout series, that is that it was meant to manage, in this case a vault, whose purpose was to re-establish humanity after the Great War. To this end, the calculator was constructed using both conventional computer parts, like central processing units, as well as a linked system of organic human brains. These brains were meant to augment the calculator's processing power, helping it achieve the aims of Vault Zero. Although these intentions were actually quite noble, especially given what we know about pre-war vaults, the calculator would suffer damage that altered its behavior. 
Before the bombs dropped, funding was cut drastically for the calculator and reinvested in frivolous things like large restaurants at the facility, meaning that critical backups that the calculator might need to function properly were never implemented. That's called foreshadowing. When the bombs dropped, the vault population was put into a sort of stasis and the calculator powered down into a hibernation mode, where it lay dormant until 2197. Some super mutants, who were remnants of the Master's army, woke the calculator from its slumber by penetrating the Cheyenne Mountain perimeter, which started to set things in motion. A defensive protocol brought deadly robots back online like the four-legged behemoths, Bahamuts who quickly moved to remove the super mutant threat. While the calculator succeeded at repelling foreign invaders, the lack of backups due to budget cuts meant that the calculator's formidable pre-war processing capabilities were cut to a fraction of what it should be, and the vast majority of the vault population that was held in stasis were killed or severely brain damaged, including the only scientists that might have been able to repair the calculator's damaged neural links. The calculator pursued its corrupted directives of pacification, that is to say that it opposed all organic life and expanded its power through force, taking nearby cities and settlements that could be used to increase its energy and industrial capacity. This directive meant that the calculator worked in a mechanical manner, seeking to expand influence and pacify all those deemed a threat to itself. Although there were many threats in the Midwestern area of the United States, the calculator posed the greatest of all these threats, and so the Midwestern Brotherhood set to confront and stop this menace. When the player character, the Warrior, finally penetrates Cheyenne Mountain and enters Vault Zero, the calculator is impressed with the Warrior's abilities, and sensing a last ditch opportunity, presents the Warrior with a choice. The Warrior can merge with the calculator, adding their brain to the neural network and thereby take control of the calculator and turn its resources over to the Brotherhood. Alternatively, a different brain can be integrated with the calculator, that of an ex-Brotherhood of Steel member named Simon Barnicky. Simon had been taken prisoner by super mutants, and later imprisoned by the calculator through a series of unfortunate events. After much torture and experimentation, his brain was removed and put into a brain bot where he was conditioned to believe in the calculator's cause, serving as its right-hand man. Simon can be reminded of his time as a human and be convinced to integrate with the calculator, which alters the calculator's directives a bit, allowing mankind to flourish, but seeking the extermination of all mutants. The third option is to let the calculator wither away as its neural network degrades and finally die. The calculator is interesting because it doesn't really act like an AI. That is to say, it pursues directives without any consideration. Maybe the calculator was built like this from the beginning, and it would be more appropriate to just refer to it as a supercomputer rather than a true AI, or perhaps the impaired function of the calculator after reawakening is solely to blame for this. The name calculator would also seem to imply a supercomputer rather than an actual AI simply calculating outcomes and making the most logical decisions rather like a chess playing computer. However, dialogue from the calculator implies that it does indeed perceive attributes we associate with consciousness, things like admiration and appealing to very human emotions like glory and guilt. The calculator's dialogue is much more human than previous entries on this list, and I would argue is evidence of real life artificial intelligence, even in its diminished state. All right, brothers and sisters, I'm doing it. We are ending this list with an entry from none other than the Brotherhood of Steel. Hold on to your irradiated butts. Somehow this entry really encapsulates the essence of this game, and I think you'll see why. Calyx was an advanced version of the Zax series of computers, and apparently meant to represent what developers intended for the Zax series of computers. Calyx was built to run the Secret Vault, and yes, that's what it's really called. The vault's mission was to research how to restore organic tissue damaged or mutated by radiation. Calyx successfully managed the vault until a conflict among the vault dwellers caused damage to its systems and caused it to lose control of the vault's security robots. The situation devolves further when super mutants attack the vault under the impression it had advanced versions of FEV. This is the access terminal for Calyx, and I don't really know what to say about that. When the player gets a chance to speak to the ultra-advanced Calyx, remember, this thing's even more advanced than Zax, 
they can ask about the details of the secret research and weapons programs, to which it responds that everything is classified. Figures, guess I'm done here, responds the player character. I can't agree more. So ends our list, but not the video, because I need to thank these wonderful people for their great support. These true believers help me bring content weekly, and if you want to join their ranks and become a patron, I have a link in the description. Welcome to the comment highlight section where I look at some comments from previous videos. In this case, the melee weapons of Fallout Part 2 and the video about how much Fallout currencies are worth. Starting with the melee video, Eric Knox brought up a great point that in Fallout 76, the Deathclaw Gauntlet benefits from both melee and unarmed bonuses, meaning if you invest a lot in both, it can be an exceptionally dangerous weapon. Several of you like Lantern's Glow here let me know that the Tiger Claws in Fallout Tactics are real items used primarily as climbing tools, and they originated in Asia. That makes a lot more sense than a dedicated weapon because of where the claws are placed, but I guess they could make an impromptu weapon if needed. Samson Leong mused why the Ballistic Fist isn't included in Fallout 4, even if it were just a homemade version similar to how people were making pipe weaponry, and I thought that was an interesting thought. Pipe weaponry is pretty weak across the board, but a unique homemade ballistic pipe fist weapon that was actually quite powerful would have been a really fun inclusion. On the subject of the ballistic fist, I failed you all by not mentioning the Sedgley OSS-38, which was a World War II version of the punch gun or ballistic fist. Firing a smooth bore 38, it was meant more as an assassination tool, and up to 200 were believed to have been made although there is no indication that they were ever used. The weapon was even shown in the movie Inglorious Bastards, where a similar weapon can be seen used near the end of the movie. Sasori Zert got a good laugh out of me with this. Ah, the Deathclaw Gauntlet, for when you're in power armor but need to scratch your own back without taking off your armor. Beautiful. Some of you like Misery reminded me of the special moves that could be performed in Fallout New Vegas, and maybe this could also be extended to the special finishing moves in Fallout 4 as well. I'll need to find a good way to talk about these, but thank you for reminding me. One for One brought up a good point, that the Fist of Rar counts as a quest item, so crafting it and then going into the Dead Money DLC will allow it to stay in your inventory, which is a big help, especially early on in the DLC since you are left with almost nothing. Moving on to the video where I tried to determine the value of Fallout currencies. Many of you let me know that the smuggling manifest I mentioned in the video says $2,500, not $25,000 was the amount of money being smuggled with all the other items. That is my bad for reading it too quickly. So yes, that would mean the pre-war stacks of money are worth $100 and not a thousand. Well that seems like a suspiciously low amount of money to be smuggled. Several of you let me know that you think I should have used a different standard to try and determine the value of in-game currency. Everything from water to food and the most common was gold. I don't think there's any one way to do this, and other YouTube channels have tried to get the value of a cap in different ways. I thought I could cut through a good amount of noise and uncertainty by going after the low value items both in our world and in Fallout, because worth is just so relative. On the subject of gold, I am wanting to do a video on the interesting aspects of precious metals in the Fallout world, because it seems to really only have worth as a store of value when a faction gets large enough. Think of the NCR and the Legion, but the other places we know about in the series don't really care about gold in the same way. A few of you like Jetroid mentioned that the back alley bowling alley Mr. Handy will ask the player for $5,000 to bowl at the facility, and if the player somehow has that much pre-war money, you can pay 5,000 pieces of pre-war money to enter. This would obviously mean that each stack is $1, making the pre-war money saga all that more mysterious. A few of you let me know of some other Fallout 76 currencies that I failed to mention, and I must ask for forgiveness. That game already has more currencies than any other game in the series, and that is not even mentioning the Atom Store Atoms currency, and they are constantly adding more with new updates, so it's really hard to keep up with it all. To end this comment highlight, Lucky Ducky made the realization that the NCR dollar in Fallout and the Canadian dollar in the real world both have the same exchange rate. Now I can't wait for Fallout 5, where we see the new Canadian Republic and the new California Republic battle it out. That's it, Adam's faithful children. Go forward in the strength of Adam. Please.
take care of yourselves, and I will see you next week.